I'm gonna give him a praise in this place. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to PAG here today. Are you excited to be in the presence of the Lord? Amen. We've had a good Sunday school. Those that have came, we had some good Sunday school classes and lessons. But here we are fixing to start service. We'd like to invite those of you that are visiting us, those of you that are tuned into the live stream. Praise the Lord. It's good to see y'all here today. How many of you excited to hear Brother Keith? Amen. He did a great job. Thankfully, the Lord's touched his body, I believe. He does feel better here today. But we're going to have him speak here this morning. Amen. But I'm excited for what the Lord has in store for us. Like I said, it's a living well. It's a living bread that never ceases, that always flows. That fountain keeps on flowing. So whatever you might have heard or have been given here this past weekend, the Lord still has more for us here this morning. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me here today. And let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying here once again. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity you've given us, Lord, to maybe get right, Lord, to draw closer, to listen to your voice, Father, to feast on the bread of life. We thank you, Father, for this time, this hour, Father, an hour, hour and a half, two hours of mercy and grace, Father, to draw to this altar, to give ourselves unto you, Lord. Jesus, I pray that you would have your way and have your liberty. Anoint this worship, Father, and anoint this word, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for this time. We thank you for this mercy and for this grace, Lord. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Give the Lord one hand clap of praise. Amen. Praise be to Jesus. So glad you came here to worship the Lord with us. I'm going to ask you to greet one another in the name of the Lord. Tell them it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. Praise be to God.
Welcome to PAG. We are so honored to have Brother Keith Malcolmson with us again in service today. Here are this week's announcements. Just a reminder that this coming Wednesday night, the March 13th, is Faith and Fellowship Wednesday for the month of March. There's something for all ages, so make sure to have your family here. Our annual Royal Family Kids Camp Banquet is this Thursday evening at 6.30 p.m. It's a great time if you do not know about Royal Family Kids Camp to come find out more about this ministry of our church. Also, we need lots of volunteers to help serve at the banquet, so please sign up in the foyer or get with Mike and Hazel Ames today, and we will also need a crew to help decorate Wednesday night after service. So if you can help with any of these things or you want to be a part of Royal Family in any way, please come to this banquet Thursday night. Ladies, remember that next Sunday afternoon is Malia and Silas's wedding shower. We want to bless them as they start their new life together soon. So please join us at 3 p.m. in the gym for their wedding shower. Men of PAG, it's that time of year again for the annual fishing trip. The dates will be April the 11th through the 13th. The cost is $75 per night and food is included at that price. The sign-up sheet is in the foyer. Get with Sister Cindy or Brother Matt Turnipseed for payment. You don't want to miss out on a great time of fun and fellowship. If you have any other questions, just get with Brother Matt.
that's older than the ages there is a promise of things yet to come there is one born for our salvation Jesus there is a light that overwhelms the darkness there is a kingdom that reigns forevermore there is freedom from the chains that bind
find their strength at the sound of your great name. Hungry souls receive grace at the sound of your great This morning, aren't you thankful for Jesus? Aren't you thankful for Jesus? Well, no other name that you can be saved. He's the great physician. He's the lily of the valley. He's the soon coming king. Hallelujah. There's nobody. Somebody shout nobody. There's nobody like Jesus. Whatever you're going through, he's your answer today. You say, Pastor, I come into this house. I'm a little weary. This spring forward messed me up just a little bit. I've spent so much over this week of myself in these meetings. But let me tell you, your strength comes from Jesus. He's the answer for everything you're going through today. Come on, put your hands together for the Lord. Praise God, I can tell you he's still at the right hand of the Father. Amen. Sister Sanja, so good to see her and Brother Roderick here this morning. Praise the Lord. Let's welcome them. 
great friends all the way down from Beaumont. We spent a great day yesterday together. She made some of the best gumbo that ever touched the roof of my mouth. But she said something, Brother Mike. She said something. She said, you know, if I was home, it would be a little bit better. She said, because I could break out that old pot. It's actually my mama's pot, I believe is what she said. She said, that mama's pot, those old pots, they used to hold the season in in the pot. So when you cook in the pot over and over and over again, the seasoning gets in. It ain't like these new pots. But them old pots have a residue of what once was. And there is a pot on Sunday morning. There is a pot on Sunday night. There's a pot on Monday night. We just kept using the same pot. And we're here on this Sunday morning. And I've got some leftover seasoning in the pot. I'm just wondering if somebody glad to be in the house of God. You're not weary. You're not tired. Come on, somebody. I want you to magnify the Lord with me. Come on, somebody. Just begin to worship God. Oh, Jesus. Sing it, Malia. They ready now. Hallelujah. 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 In Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was saved for us. You're the Son of God in heaven. You are high and lifted up. All the world will praise Jesus. Oh, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. You're the Son of God in heaven. You are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise your great name. Oh, Redeemer, my hero. Oh, yes. Oh, Lord Almighty. Oh, my Savior. Say it, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy, Worthy the is the Lamb. Lamb. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. He's the Son of God and man. And you are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise your great name. Oh. Praise the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. Come on, give him a good, I'm not talking about a golf praise. I'm talking about one of those ones that just bellow up in your spirit that he is a worthy God. He's a faithful God. He's a good God. Oh, my, my. He saves to the uttermost. He's the baptizer in the Holy Ghost of Oh, praise God. Isn't he worthy this morning? And turn to somebody and say, he alone is worthy. I told somebody the other day, I said, you know, most of the conflicts I've had in the ministry is just because I'm simply trying to make Christ everything. And I can tell you, the enemy doesn't want you to make Christ everything. When you can take your life and throw it humbly at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, the only reason I'm breathing is because of you. The only, come on somebody. The only reason I'm still married is because of you. The only reason my kid's in church, the only reason I got sanity is because of you. I I live my life and I know what I'll do with it, but Jesus, oh my, I feel something right there. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God for Yandala Labos, Totala Bosa. 
Oh, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Some of you get your mind off the problem. Get it on Jesus. Get get your mind off the situation and get it on Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord. We're going to look up, Lord. We're going to keep looking up. Lord, if our redemption was drawn now on Friday night, surely on Sunday morning. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. I bless you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. Oh, God, I bless you, Lord. My spirit, my soul, we magnify the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord. Praise the Lord. We want to go to the Lord this morning in prayer. But first, we want to give God glory. Brother Ben is feeling much better. Come on, give the Lord some praise for that. I'm sure they're watching. We love you, Brother Ben. We're praying for you. We're praying for complete healing, not just a little healing. We're believing for just complete healing in your body, that you're going to come through this better than when you went into it. Praise the Lord. How many of you know the Lord never gives anything back half measure? Or as good as it was, he gives it back better. Can you say amen? That's what we're believing for. He gives you a better life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He doesn't remodel your life. He comes and makes you totally new. He doesn't make you a better husband. He makes you a new husband. He doesn't make you a better person. He makes you a new person. Religion makes you tries to make you better but the kingdom of God will make you new born again new sister Shelly you've been made new by the blood of the lamb come on sister Shelly new behold all things not some things not a few things not the things you didn't like about yourself anyway I mean even the things you liked about yourself it takes that away makes you new puts it in Christ come on sometimes we think we need to take the best of us into our Christianity no sir he said well I was pretty good at that I want to hold on to that that's what Saul thought he said thought you could pick and choose what you wanted to keep but how many of you know outside of the new birth all of that must die in Christ because even our goodness is filth I learned a long time ago, you boil everything down, even our goodness has its own selfish desire in it. But God will boil it all down. He'll say, I make you completely new. Thank God for his newness. He'll make you a new wine skin. Oh, praise the Lord. We're going to go to prayer asking our prayer team if they would come this morning. We're going to believe God for so many different needs. Amen. I, how many of you have been hit with sickness this week? So many homes and people. and I mean, we had it in our home. And Brother Keith had to fight through some sickness and had family members that passed this week. But you pressed on through and you fought on through. And i just so blessed that Brother Keith, I know I was with him. I know how much he was battling in his body, but pressed through it to deliver the Word of God. And I told him on the way home, thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ, he's got crown of thorns on his head. He's been up all night long, didn't sleep all night. And religious people keep you up at night. Kept him up all night long. He's battered, he's beaten, he's bloodied, he's walked the Via Della Rosa. He's been stabbed in the side. He's been betrayed by his friends. He's, I mean, he's been through it. He's hanging suspended. How many of you know all the blood's gushing out? No doubt he's in just excruciating pain. And, but he knows there's a will to be done. There's a will. There's a race to be finished. And so even there on the cross, he's directing, he's saving, he's entering into today. You'll see enter into my kingdom he's he's moving he's he's saying all the words that's got to be said because he he doesn't want to get into this situation and not do what he came to and how many of you know if you'll let the enemy he'll rob you of fulfilling the task at hand come on somebody i know you may be a little weary this morning but you gotta 
Say, Lord, I know you brought me to this moment for a purpose. And I've got to finish this day. I've got to be able to lay my head down at night and say, Lord, I did it all. I, I said everything you wanted me to say through all of the agony, the jeering, the mockery. I'm thankful you can do it today. So if you've got a need in your life, if you're sick, if you're broken, if you need filled, whatever you're going through, I believe you can find your answer. And these that are going to pray for you this morning, they're prayed up. We know God can do it. Come on, all over this house. You need prayer. I want you to come. You need prayer in your spirit. Come on, we need God to touch us today. We need God to touch us. We need God to heal. We need God to minister to Brother Ben. Touch the turnip seed family. My God, all of these needs. Sham da 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 bo, sham da 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 bo, see. Oh, yes, Lord. Call and see to still. Raging me to still every wave at your name, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence me, is your
Jesus. You silence fear, cause you're Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Your name is Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus. Oh my God, yes Jesus, yes Jesus Hallelujah, hallelujah Jesus. Lord, we present our bodies at living sacrifice. Oh, Father. Oh, Father. you this morning. Lay your life on that altar. You've picked it up. It used to be there. You used to live to present your body to your great God. But you've picked it up again. Living your life instead of his life. Today, let's lay that life on the altar. calling you. You feel the draw of the Lord. Oh, return home, child of God. Oh, return back to the place that God was so real to your heart.
praise the Lord. How many of you know the Lord will bring you and I to a place where real growth, there's the potential of real growth, Brother Bobby. The real moments of life that God will bring you into, things you've been praying for, Lord, grow in me. Lord, do something in my heart. Conform me to your image, but God will set the stage. He'll set the playing field to bring you into the moment to be able to make the right decision for your heart. How many know the Lord will do that? Friends, sometimes it takes days and months and even years for God to set that moment to where either it's you're going to grow in the Lord and become mature in Christ or you're going to go back around that mountain back around, back through the hot desert, back through the same old, same old, same old, same old, just the cycle of life. Just around and around. But one day you say, Lord, I see it now. I didn't see it last time and I missed it, that opportunity that I could really grow in Christ. Come on, somebody. Head northward in God. I believe somebody's there today. I don't know what situation you're in, but how many of you know it never looks exactly like the last one? But it has all the same ingredients. Are you listening? Last time it came through a co-worker. This time it comes through a family member. I'm just telling you, just, but it's the same point in your life. God's trying to make more like Him. You believe that this morning? Father, do that in us today, whoever that is. I pray, God, they would fall upon your mercy upon the cross this opportunity to to be more like you father let them take advantage of that let us grow in christ mature in god father we love you for what we feel what we sense what we see we give you praise and glory and everybody shouted a big this morning Amen. amen come on put your hands together for the lord My youngest sister's 48. She's always been my baby sister, and I've protected her from everything. Anytime she had something, she called me. I can't do this. God's got it, though. God's already healed her body. She has stage 2 colorectal cancer. Bills had started coming in. She had started panicking. I told her not to worry about it. You can pay $10 a month, whatever. It's going to be good. Don't worry about it. She was going to drive back and forth to Little Rock every day. The radiation where it was, they said, it's going to be hard on you. Very hard. I called her and I said, you're not driving back and forth. You call because they have apartments for me and see what it costs. And call me back and let me know. She called me crying. It's $1,500. I said, I don't care. I don't care what it costs. You're not driving back and forth. I said, you call and you book that apartment today. Y'all, we have an awesome God because... She called them right back, and there's not many people that knew, but there was someone that was associated with them through the horse shows that Emma does had already paid that $1,500. Now you tell me we don't serve an awesome God. They put a benefit for her. And there's another guy in Belleville, Gary Noblet, that has bad cancer too. They had a benefit for him on Saturday. Now, this is Danville and Belleville, and if you know them, we're little towns. He raised over $11,000 for him. The very next day, God blessed Nancy and them with over $10,000. Y'all, this is two small towns that just your hardworking people live. So you tell, we've got a God. I mean, people has touched Nancy's heart through God. She is already healed. She's going to go through this because God is building her testimony because she's always set back. But she is moving forward, and I appreciate y'all's prayers for her. But don't wait on him. Keep praying because it will come. Come on, give the Lord some praise. Give the Lord some Amen. Praise God. You may be seated here this morning. Praise the Lord. Turn to somebody beside you. Say, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. 
Amen. So wonderful to be here. What an incredible time we had over the days of camp meeting. I mean, the Lord just moved so incredibly. And I want to say before I move any further, thank you. Thank you. Thank you from Sister Melissa, the bottom of our heart. Thank you from this staff. You are were absolutely incredible. Come on, give yourself a good hand clap this morning. You were incredible over these days. The hospitality, how you have made our visitors feel. We've just been, oftentimes, we are the ones that are the recipients of the thank yous on all of your behalf of my God, that the Lord has used you to minister Christ. People that have come from across this country had a man come from Missouri and was just so blown away of the genuine love and care, Brother Shane, that he felt in this house. I mean, you can go to church and even people can say, good to have you, but you know when it's something deeper than just good to have you. And I thank you for that. You work so diligently. I said Friday night, all of the workers, the young people, the remnant, they did incredible incredible it's a beautiful thing to see people mature and enlarge into places can you say amen to that and that's a beautiful thing i used to always hear brother clinton and he preached a message one time that said somebody will cross that river and he said in the beginning of that message i listened to it probably a hundred times as a new convert that god will have to remove big things to allow little things to become bigger things and I'm so thankful for these young people, this remnant, that they grew into it and then they enlarged their tent and were used mightily of God. And I thank all of you for doing that. Amen. It takes everybody. Somebody shout everybody. Everybody to do something like that. But it takes everybody to do something like this this morning. And tomorrow morning, it'll take everybody again, Brother Todd. And then Tuesday, it's going to take everybody. That's the way that it is. So we're going to ask the ushers if you'd please come this morning and take up the tithe and offering here this morning. Praise the Lord. Do want to say thank you for your giving over in abundance for camp meeting. We're still tallying all of that, but I'm confident the Lord definitely met the budget for camp meeting. Come on, give the Lord some praise. Come on, that's, that's incredible. I'm so thankful. For the Lord's, we've got Sister Tasha. She's back there one more time. Man in that post. My brother texts me after the service. He said, I remember the fish story. Just so you know, you look at him. That's not, I wasn't making that up. What are you saying? I believe God can speak to somebody. But if you'd like to give through the giving kiosk, please see Sister Tasha. If you'd like to text to give, please give that away. But whichever way you give, it still takes a miracle. It really does. It takes a miracle. I'm sure there's a nod at the lady's head to my right back here. Validating it takes a miracle. Let me tell you something. If it didn't take a miracle for us to do what God's called us to do, I can tell you we're not operating in faith. It's very easy for us to operate in a comfort place, but I learned very early on the only way to do this is to get out of the boat and say, God, if you don't do it, it can't be done. You say amen to that. So thank you for your giving here this morning. Father, thank you. You have poured out time and time and time and time again. And, oh, God, I'm asking this morning that you'd meet the need of this house, the miracle that's needed in every way. You're a faithful God. I thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of your people. I know they love you. I know your faithfulness is in them. I pray, God, that you would just bless in every way today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you for your giving. Your heart 
and lead me into love to those around. Sing holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you, O oh Lord, and I will not be shaken, and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I One more time, holy, holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes, in Lord, and show me who you are, and fill me and lead me in your love to the Praise the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. Amen. How many of you are appreciative of this worship team here this morning? Didn't they do a great job this week at camp meeting? Absolutely incredible. Well, today that we're so blessed, so honored. Amen. Brother Keith, he may have stepped out just real quick like. Praise the Lord. Well, you don't want me to sing. That's for sure. So I'll just encourage you just for a moment. But we're so excited about what the Lord has done over these days of camp meeting. It has been incredible of what God has done. So many testimonies of what the Lord has done. Had some ladies that came all the way from the uh, the board state line there of Alabama and Florida. And uh, they text me last night of all that God did in their life. And uh, already looking forward to camp meeting 2025. And so, Melissa and I, we've been talking all day yesterday and, and uh, just how exciting this was this year, but also how much we're looking forward to next year. And we know God is doing something powerful. How many of you know you go into meetings such as this and, and uh, you just sometimes need a fresh touch of God for yourself? There was things that, God, I, need, I needed the Lord to minister to my heart. And, and I can tell you, over these days, I was able to spend with Pastor Keith just there at the house and listening and being around other ministers and sitting on these chairs and listening to the Word of God. And uh, I can tell you, the Lord established some deep things in my spirit. And uh, I can tell you, that's a wonderful thing for God to establish your heart. And uh, so excited about what the Lord has done. If you didn't attend all the services, I encourage you, go back and listen to every single message. So, I mean, if you got to close yourself in, whatever you got to do, if, if we're in this together, somebody shout together. If we're in this together, then it is vital. This is a real body. It's a real body. This isn't something of a religious form. This is a real body that requires that we all hear the same thing. 
Amen. Can you imagine, Brother Young, on a sports team, whatever else, this person doesn't know the play. I remember when I was a kid, if I ever missed a practice, whatever else, I'd get in there and everybody would be making the right screen, making the right cut, and I'd be looking around, and the coach would say, you need to just sit down till you learn the play. Praise God. Learn the play so we can all be in this together. But we're honored to have Pastor Keith with us. What incredible words that he ministered on Sunday, uh, Friday rather, and I'm looking forward to this message on Sunday. Would you please all over this house stand and welcome this man of God as he comes this morning. Amen. You may be seated here this morning for a moment. Praise God. It's so uh, wonderful just to be here today uh, and this week in Pottsville Assemblies of God. I bring greetings and love to you from many in Limerick, Ireland. They're praying for you, people redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ out of every sin, immorality, thing that you can possibly imagine. There's still power in this gospel, you know to save the worst of sinners. You know, every morning I walk into that church and we gather, I look around, I can't help but smile with thankfulness to the grace and the love and the mercy of God. This is my God who saves these lives and plucks them from the very hand of Satan. There's power in the gospel. Do you know, we prayed from the beginning of the church. We started 10 years ago. We pioneered we prayed constantly that that church would be representative of the entire community. Whatever sin is out there, it would be represented in here. That no matter who walked in that door, they'd come in saying, is there any hope? Is there any hope of salvation? Can the Lord deliver me? I can point across that room. Such were some of us. Saints, this is real. Out there. In the darkness of this world and religion, they've lost the power and reality of this, but not in the real bride, not in the real church. We still have this. Praise God. Just a wonderful blessing to be with you again. You know, I was glad when I got here, I discovered that Pastor Robin had a mother and a father, and uh, I don't know where they are, but so wonderful to meet them. Just a wonderful blessing. It's real. He's got family just to meet the family. First night, we drew past the church and we went Pottsville Assemblies of God. It's a real building, a real place. You are here and just been a wonderful blessing meeting all these young couples, getting married. I uh, heard that some several relationships came out of this camp meeting last year. I said, Pastor, what sort of a anointing or preaching did you have here? in this building. Uh, Three weddings, so wonderful. And, you know, you young couples, to build your marriage on the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no greater foundation, no greater start in this walk, just that Christ would be your all in all. And so I thank uh, Pastor Robin and Sister Melissa, just wonderful friends, really appreciate you and the Lord. We've shared so much fellowship. They've ministered to us so, so many times in Ireland and Wales, Germany, elsewhere. And uh, we appreciate the Word of God uh, very much. And of course, Luke and Levi, we haven't seen as much of them over our our side. I keep saying, bring bring the boys with you as well. Now you can tell them. Uh, I've let the secret out. Uh, You know, in that house down the road, I was very glad for Luke every time he passed through with this dog that's called Knox, (laughs) named after John Knox of Scotland. Uh, Luke was very kind just to cover its eyes that it wouldn't see me. That got me very worried. I thought, I've heard of this dog. They won't even let the dog look at me lest it get a taste for this uh, Irish flesh. So I I just want to thank Luke for preserving me and my state of affliction. Uh, But it's so wonderful. You you feel like family here. And uh, I I feel very at home. I really do. So we in Limerick, we pray for you. Please pray for us. We're in a battle just like you. The battle never relents, never eases up. It's intensive. 
every new convert that comes through that door, they'll fight hell to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that battle here. Saints of God, the day is late. Darkness is dawning fast. Time is coming when we won't be able to labor. So let's labor now together. So we pray for you. We love you. And uh, we pray that you'll remember us in prayer. Amen. I want you to turn here this morning to Matthew chapter 25 with me. Matthew chapter 25. And all week long, we've been dealing with this theme of look up. And I just want to preach this last message as we stand and read the Word of God together here. Matthew chapter 25, reading from verse 1 through to verse 13. And my message this morning, the wise and the foolish virgins. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Every word of this is very weighty this morning, saints. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil. For our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Will you help me? Lift your hands. Just let's pray unto the Lord. Let's humble ourselves. Let, let's be sure that even before we, we preach the Word of God, that our heart is tender, that it is open to the searching of the Holy Spirit. This preacher, even as he preaches, need the, needs the same grace, that God would search my heart, that he would deal with me, that he would deal with every person in this room. My God, we plead your grace and mercy. Don't leave us to our own thoughts and imagination. Don't leave us to our own decision. Don't Leave, lead us to our own ways. Oh God, be gracious unto us. Apprehend us this morning. Convict us by the Holy Spirit. Lead us and guide us. Lord God, probe us and deal with our hearts. My God, it's such a dark and deceptive fire. And Lord God, we want to be made ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 You may be seated here this morning. My message, the wise and the foolish virgins. It says in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 44. And listen this carefully. Therefore be ye also ready. Ready. Why do you need to be ready? For in such an hour as ye think, that's the mind, 
That's the logical process of intellect. That's the thoughts that roll through the mind and the heart of an individual. In such an hour, he's talking about a period of time that you think not the Son of Man cometh. You're called to be ready in such an hour when many in the church are going to begin to think he's not coming yet. The word ready means to be adjusted. It means to bring about changes. It means to be prepared or to have everything to hand. You don't need to get ready. You're prepared. In other words, you're usable. You're in the right place. You're in the right condition. You're in the right state of mind, the right state of heart. Everything is prepared for the coming of the Lord. And you know what Jesus says? This is the command of Jesus. Not an example from a preacher's sermon. This is the clear instruction and and teaching of Christ. Therefore, be ye also ready. He is teaching them. It is a condition of heart and attitude. Christ gives several parables or stories about his soon coming return, about him coming back again. And in at least several of those parables, he talks about a time of delay, a certain set period of time. Again, as we've already said this week, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, it has a context. The context is Matthew chapter 24. It is doctrine. It is eschatology. It is prophetic teaching by Jesus Christ about that stage, generation, and hour just before he comes in his glory. Saints of God, we're given exact, clear teaching in all of this. In chapter 25, we begin to see the inward attitudes of those who are prepared and made ready for the coming of the Lord. In chapter 24, we see the outward circumstances politically, socially, morally in all of our society and world, right across our nations. In Matthew 24, he is dealing with the conditions in around us. All of the, 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 the iniquity abounding, the deception of prophets in the church. We read in detail all of these things. But when we get to Matthew 25, he goes right to the inward attitude of the heart and the thoughts of the mind. We have a dealing of the very thoughts that pass through your mind. Dangerous thinking, dangerous thoughts, things that can dominate you. That begin, They begin with a thought rolling in the mind. And from there, they go down into the attitudes of the heart. And from the attitudes of the heart, they become actions and lifestyle and decisions and the entire direction of your life. You, you don't even realize how dangerous a thought passing through the mind, unchecked, untested by the Word of God, it could lead you far down the road away from the reality of this gospel. And that's what we have in this parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. Christ gives teaching for the last hour, the last chapter of church history, a warning of all the signs and what is going to happen. But then alongside it, he throws parables. Chapter 24 and 25 is one sermon, one complete sermon given by Christ. It's all about eschatology. It's all about Bible prophecy, but it's more than that. It's about heart attitudes. It's about preparations. It's about the people that are going to be ready in that hour. Those he speaks about in Matthew 24, he deals with constantly in parables. And what we have here is Christ using parables. What is a parable? It is an earthly story to explain a heavenly meaning. 
Christ wants to teach you something, so he takes something from normal, natural, familiar life. And he uses that very familiar, normal thing that you can see and picture to present to you a powerful, dynamic, and urgent message. The word parable means to throw something alongside. It means to place alongside. It's a natural story set next to a spiritual doctrinal truth, a normal story by doctrinal truth. And that's what the wise and foolish virgins are. It is a parable, a story, but it's being set beside sound, solid, biblical doctrine. And it's to help you. It's to explain. It is to compare one with the other. A story, an illustration placed alongside solid teaching about the last days. And so we are to come to understand this. I want to give three things here this morning, and I'm not going to squeeze everything out of these verses, but I have something very particular to deal with here in this church this morning. Three vital things that I want to show you. First of all, I want to deal with the similarity between the wise and foolish virgins. The similarity How hard it is to tell them apart. How hard it is to distinguish a foolish, false virgin from a real one. This is the teaching of Christ. Then we're going to look at who these foolish virgins are. And then thirdly of all, we're going to look at who the wise virgins are. This is a message for this hour, right now. Do you know, I've grown up all my days, and the Pentecostal movement has emphasized this parable, this teaching of the wise and foolish virgins. It's for now, and yet I don't think that we've been more ignorant about it than right now in church history. We need to hear again, what is Christ's message for this hour? This Matthew 24 is for this hour. It is this time. It is this season, the beginning of sorrows. You know why? Because we're meant to look up. And the wise and foolish virgins are a vital parable brought in a story to help you to begin to look up, to have your focus right in this hour. You cannot afford to be a foolish virgin who is distracted in this hour. Let's look at this more carefully. The similarity of the wise and the foolish virgins. Look with me in verse 1. It says, then. It's talking about a time, a particular condition in the world. It's talking about a biblically taught prophetic season. Do you know Christ in Matthew and Mark and Luke taught more about this season than anybody else? And yet most of the church are ignorant of the teaching of Christ and Bible prophecy. He says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. When? When? It's talking about a time. This hour right now. The church condition in America will be likened unto ten virgins. When? Then. Right then. In that day, in that hour, in that time, the beginning of sorrows, when darkness is beginning to fall, when we begin to head towards the midnight hour, the darkest hour in history and in the nation, then the kingdom of heaven will be likened or it will become very similar to this particular story. Ten virgins. And look what it says about these virgins. This is what the church in America looks like right now. I am fully convinced of it. Which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Do you see what Christ begins to compare wise virgins with foolish virgins. The church in America, the best of it, not the Catholic, not the apostate religions, none of them. I'm talking about those 
who look like wise virgins. You can't distinguish between foolish and wise looking naturally at them. You say it's all the remnant. This is the best in this nation. These are the real church of Jesus Christ. Do you know Christ all through his teaching compared? He compared wheat and tares. They look the same on, until when? Harvest time. When is harvest time? The end of the age. In other words, something is going to happen at the end of the age. The wheat and the tares, you can't distinguish between them. They are similar. They look alike. They grow together. They're in the same place doing the same things at the same time. Christ goes through all of these teaching. He speaks about the sheep and the goat. Not like our Western uh, sheep and goat. When you go to the Middle East, a sheep looks like a goat. If, if you and I, I'm no expert, that shepherd has to put the rod down and every animal, sheep and goat, goes under that rod. Do you know why? He's dividing. That's a goat. That's a sheep. That's a goat. That's a sheep. We can't even distinguish. That shepherd recognizes when that goat begins to butt up against him. I, I once stood with a lady at the door of our church, says, I want to come in. I said, you're not coming in. The only time I've ever done that in my life says, I thought you were a shepherd. I said, I am a shepherd. says, but you don't love me enough to come looking for me. says, a shepherd would have come looking for me. I said, a sheep doesn't bite you. She was, that day she was high on drugs, a deceiver, a liar, a disturber of the church of God. Saints of God, I'm telling you, a goat isn't a sheep and a sheep isn't a goat. A sheep acts in a certain way. Their nature is a certain something. Jesus compares the narrow way with the broad way. They're not the same. The entrance is different. Did you think that was comparing sinners with believers? The broad way of sinners, the narrow way of the saved. Oh, no. It's talking about two different kinds of conversion in the church. Two different pathways of Christianity in the church. See how Christ isn't comparing in his parables the world with the church. He's not doing that. Time after time after time, he is revealing, defining, showing you the true from the false sitting together in the same conventions, in the same meetings, in the same churches, under the same preaching and teaching. All of this is in the same environment. And Christ is saying the narrow way isn't the same as the broad way. First of all, the entrance is different. It is a narrow, tight, agonizing way to get into the kingdom of God. There is agony, travail, repentance. Those that come in the broad way, they don't need to lose anything. They don't need to change anything. I said a sinner's prayer. I want all the blessings. I want ministry. You've never been born again. You must be born again. When we lose the message of the new birth, there is disaster in the church. We need to go back again and recapture the power of this. He begins preaching on building on a rock and building on sand, two different foundations, wise and foolish. They're all building. They're all attempting to build something for Jesus Christ but radically different. He gives parables about the fish, the four kinds of ground, four different hearts with their impact of the Word of God. Some even receive it immediately with great joy and spring up immediately. They're not here tomorrow. You may wonder, where's Jimmy? Where's Sally? Oh, what an extraordinary salvation. They were in here on the front row shouting, dancing, Tomorrow they're gone. You get confused. I tell you, don't get confused with tares or with goats or with the temporary. You that are here for the long endurance, walking with God. Saints of God, Christ compares two different things here. He also talks in Revelation 17 about the harlot church, comparing it with the spotless bride of Christ the lamb's bride, the bleeding lamb. There is a church that is married to the lamb of God. 
But do you know what you have in this parable? It's not the bride of Christ that you see. What you see are 10 bridesmaids, not wives. It's a different parable. It's not about Mary and the bridegroom. The, these are bridesmaids, 10 in number. You know why he's not dealing with one person? He is dealing with a mixed company, the kingdom of God. All those that gather in the remnant church of this hour, and he's dealing, showing there is a difference. He is comparing them. How does he compare them? He actually says here, all are virgins. The foolish are virgins. That's why you can't recognize. They're not getting drunk this morning. They're not in a bed of sin this morning. I would dare say they're not blaspheming this morning. It says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 4, talking of the virgins, these are they which follow the Lamb. When he speaks about virgins, he's speaking about those that desire the Lamb of God. They are showing every appearance we're following the Lamb. He goes further in Revelation. It's speaking about those who are moral. They're outwardly pure. They have come out from the world. They're wearing garments of white. Do you know who these virgins are? They're outwardly professing Christians, members of the body of Christ. They're in close association with each other on a Wednesday night and a Sunday morning and a Sunday night. They'll be in the prayer meeting. They'll talk and fellowship around meals together. That's the first great comparison. Both are virgins. The foolish are virgins. The wise are virgins. One foolish, one wise, all are virgins. They're not out in that world. And so Christ is saying, there is a church in the last hour, at the beginning of sorrows. And you would say they're a virgin. They've come out of the world. They're not out there in the world. Look as well what it says in verse 1. All had lamps. The foolish virgins have lamps. It's not just the wise have lamps. The foolish have a lamp in their hand. They're virgins. They look like virgins. They have a lamp in their hands. What does the lamp represent? Verse 1, they took their lamp. It means to take, to hold, or to seize with great aggression, with great determination. You know what that tells me? The foolish grab the lamp. Look at the determination. Look at the zeal. Look at the commitment towards this lamp. What does the lamp represent? The word means a bright and shining light. Do you know what this lamp, the Greek word, literally means a cup on a saucer. It looked a bit like a flat milk jug. That's what it was that held the oil. And so this lamp that they are holding, the wise and the foolish have a lamp, all of them. Every single foolish virgin that's going to be locked out of the kingdom of God in this last hour. That aren't ready, they're not prepared, they're not adjusted. They're all virgins and they all have a lamp in their hand. And see this lamp, it was the instrument of holding the oil. It had a wick that burnt, and all the oil in that lamp burnt to give you light. Do you know what? Every foolish virgin has the same lamp as the real virgins, as the pure, wise virgins. All of them have lamps. They have a lamp in their hand with oil in their hand, and it's burning with a fire. You can see it visibly and outwardly. Saints of God, I'm taking you somewhere here this morning. I'm simply giving you the text of Scripture here. What does the lamp represent? It speaks of your outward testimony, your good works, your testimony of how you got born again of you speaking about your relationship with Jesus Christ, about your good works, even your right message. You can't fault their message. They say the right thing. I believe in the atonement. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe Jesus is coming back again. They believe all these things. In other words, their lamp is burning in the darkness of night. You cannot fault them. 
Let me tell you more what their lap, lamp represents. They evangelize the lost in the workplace, in their family. They'll say to others, you need Jesus like I have Jesus. They speak of Christ. They're caught up in ministry in the local church. Let me say more. They travel from church to church preaching. They're in gifted ministry, these foolish virgins. They have a lamp. It is the outward, visible, public testimony that persuades you all is well. So they're virgins. They have a lamp burning in their hand. And look what it says. All went forth to meet the bridegroom. They know Jesus is coming back again. In fact, more than that, they know what hour it is. That's shocking. They know the signs. They have heard the preaching. They're aware and conscious. And so they say, let's go forth to meet the bridegroom. They're looking for him coming. They believe he's coming again. They believe they're ready for his coming. Yes. They're actually caught up with all the real virgins saying, let's go out and meet the bridegroom. They hear the call, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Yes. They experience an awakening within their soul. And so you see them here going forth. The right actions, calling on the name of the Lord. They know who he is. They know what real salvation is. This isn't a, some twisted gospel. Call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. They believe all of this. They believe uh, in real salvation, in the blood, in the cross. Do you know all the churches of Galatia? Remember they departed from Paul. They believed in being born again. They believed in the cross. They believed in the word of God. They believed in the atonement. And yet they went back to the law. They added circumcision. You need to be circumcised to be born again. Saints of God, if only we realize this is the teaching of Christ for this hour and time. All are expecting the sudden return of the bridegroom. They believe they're part of the end day church. They believe it's the end of the age, the last days. And notice this last point about their similarity. All slumbered in sleep. All of them. What is slumber? It's the stage before complete sleep. It's the stage of semi-consciousness. You're half awake and you're half asleep. And you're there, you're not totally asleep. See, that's how you fall asleep in the house of God. You fall into a halfway house. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I'm partially open. I've got one eye open, one ear open. I'm half in the house of God. Yeah. It's such a dangerous state and condition. Half-heartedness. You're half-baked. Yeah. You ever meet a half-baked Christian? They'll tear the place down a Sunday morning. You can't find, or sorry, a Sunday morning, and you can't find the Monday morning. Yeah. Half baked. Yeah. Oh, how dangerous. We need to run to God, saints of God. Yeah. It's such a real thing. That condition of sleeping, and yet a real believer can sleep. All slumber and sleep. I dare say we live in an hour where there's a slumber and a sleep across the entire church in America. There's no revival, no awakening. There is personal revival and church revivals. I don't see national revival. Men talk about that time after time after time. But I tell you, when you read about real revivals and holy conviction and the power of the Spirit of God fallen... And so there's a sleep and a slumber in this hour. But do you know what? For the foolish, it is fatal. For the wise, it is temporary. But you better discern what you are this morning. So that's my first thing. The similarity of the wise and the foolish. Number two, the foolish virgins. Let's just look at this a bit closer here this morning. If you're going to look up, Saints of God, you better urgently look up to the Lord Jesus Christ here this morning. 
Behold, our redemption draweth nigh. There's a climate in this world where we've got to look heavenward and say, come, Lord Jesus, urgently. You're the lover of my soul. You are my salvation. I don't have anything in this world. Nothing can satisfy. The foolish virgins, the word foolish that is used here in the Greek, this is what it means to be dull, stupid, talking about the mental capacity not talking about academic. I'm, I'm a bit dull academically, I want to tell you. But I'm not dull mentally as far as spiritual things go, I want to assure you. This is talking about a condition of mental capacity. Dull, stupid, heedless. The Greek word means to have a flat edge or a blunt edge on your knife. It means to be thoughtless. It's the Greek word Moros, where we get moron. You know, when I was a little kid, if my mommy or daddy ever heard us call someone a moron, you, you, I, I tell you, you'd run for your life. Mommy and daddy would be after me with a stick. You will not escape a slap or on the seat of correction, I want to tell you. You don't call anyone a moron. You know what? That, that is such a despicable term. It's a serious term to call someone a moron. We casually say they're a moron. Listen to what the Bible says concerning this term, moros. It's the word foolish. You are a fool. But what does it mean? It means lacking a grip on reality. There is a reality you don't even have a grip on. That's what being foolish is. You're not gripping the reality in your mind, your thinking, your actions, your deeds. There is a reality the Word of God teaches, and you're not even living in that. You're you're living in some make-believe unreality. That's what being foolish is in the house of God. This doesn't dawn on you. It's an act in the house of God. It's a Sunday morning together. The Bible talks about this condition of being a moros, a foolish, lacking a a grip of reality. The word means literally to be brainless. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 22, whosoever shall say, thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. He is actually saying, don't call a man casually a fool. Why would Jesus say, don't call an individual a fool? Or else you will be in danger of hellfire. Why would he say that? Because when you call someone a fool, you're saying you're past salvation. You're hopeless. You're unsavable. You don't stand a chance. You're outside the pale. You're beyond redemption. Never, ever say that anyone. You're not to sit in judgment of that. It is such a serious thing for an individual to be found a fool or to call someone a fool. It is such a serious mental, spiritual condition. It is beyond repair. It is beyond recovery. It it is devastating that someone would be of such a brainless condition that they live in a state of utter unreality. They go through the motions, they lift their hands, say amen, sing the songs, preach the sermons, give the testimonies, and they go home and live in utter unreality. Sing to God, Jesus has given a parable. You look like a virgin, you have a lamp, you have an outward testimony, you've got a fire burning, but it's all outward in ministry. And yet you are not the same as the virgin brides. You're you're actually not the same as those that are wise. Neither have you made yourself ready. You haven't adjusted yourself. And yet in your own reality, you go, I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm living right. I'm in the church of God. I dress right. I sing right. I speak right. I'm in the right place as long as I'm in church. And yet Christ says there's something deeper. There's a deeper thing here. What are we dealing with? They took the lamps, listen, but no oil. You can have a lamp, but no oil. We know that the Holy Spirit is represented by oil. 
The Holy Spirit is undoubtedly the oil. But look at these foolish virgins. They have no oil. They took their lamps. They thought the lamp was sufficient. The outward public testimony, the words, the actions, what was visible, they thought that was enough. But no real thought about the oil. They don't want the oil. They want the testimony, the reputation. They're not careful about the oil of the Holy Spirit. But they are very, very particular about what people think of them or what is seen in the visible world. I can't tell you how dangerous this is. Yet it was the source of fire and light. Oil gives light and darkness. If you want light, you look for oil. If you want reputation and the applause of men, you look for the lamp. The lamp can be very dangerous, very deceptive. You're caught up on what you look like outwardly, and you take your eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one who looketh at you from on high. They thought of the present instead of the future. They only cared about now. What they get now. They actually only thought about the outward rather than the inward because only God sees the inward. Man sees the outward. That's what they're focused upon. This is remarkable sense of the church life, but not of their future life at the coming of Christ. The snatching away of these virgins. They had no consciousness of that time. They haven't been preparing themselves for that day and that hour. They're living in the church. The church is filled with people. They're living for the church, for ministry, for now, for reputation, for sermons, for evangelism, for ministry, for charity, for mission trips. Saints, all those things are right and godly and good, and the wise virgins do all these things. But I want to tell you, the wise virgins only do these things because their eyes are upon the coming of the Lord. That's, their eyes are upright on the Lord. You can do the same things, but be radically different in motive and agenda and heart, and the reason you're doing it. Oh, we need the grace of God this morning. We need the Holy Spirit to search us here this morning. They had so much right, but the most important thing wrong. You can't afford to have that wrong. You could have a hundred things in place, but you don't have this in place. What their focus was on was the outward oil, not the inward oil. Listen to this carefully. What does the oil represent? It says in Romans 8 verse 9, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you don't have, and listen to this, the indwelling Spirit, you're not born again. I'm not talking about the baptism and the Holy Ghost. I will get to that. But this oil in the lamp is different than the oil in the vessel in the text. Two different things. You see, in doctrine, we are taught that every genuine born-again Christian, you're not even saved, you don't know Christ, if the Spirit of Christ does not indwell you. You're not redeemed, you're not saved, you're not forgiven. When you're born again, the Spirit of God comes to indwell you. That is the teaching of the indwelling Spirit. That's not the baptism in the Holy Ghost. The baptism is a distinct later experience for power, the indwelling spirit for salvation to be right with God, to walk with Him, to be ready to meet Him. But the baptism is power for ministry in this world. They're two different things. And you get it in this parable. It is vital to this parable. I'm going to show you this here this morning. You know, over in the book of Jude, talking about apostasy, he says in Jude chapter 118, how that they told you there should be mockers when in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Who are they? Verse 19, these be they 
who separate themselves. That word separate themselves is a medical term, meaning to have a member of your body disjointed from the body. Who are they? They disjoint themselves or they separate themselves from the body of Christ. They remove themselves out of the body. He also says they're sensual or they live by the five senses, not led by the Spirit of God. They go by their eyes and their ears, feelings, touch, smell. They are sensual believers. We have this all over the church of Jesus Christ. Men, women think they know the Spirit of God. They're moved by the senses, the outward man. How dangerous if you don't even know how to discern the real Holy Ghost. It also says in Jude, having not the Spirit. They think they're born again. They think they're ready to meet Christ, and yet they disjoint themselves. They're moved by those emotions. Don't have the spirit. Look at this outward oil for a moment. They want to use the oil, the Holy Spirit. See, they don't have regeneration, the indwelling spirit. They want the anointing, the baptism in the Holy Ghost. That's what they care about. The power for service. What's visible. What's public? What's in ministry? What's in the church? That's what they care about. They want the outward oil used for the outward life, not the inward life. For gifts, service, and ministry, but not for inward character of the heart. Not for communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not for their private, personal prayer life. They're actually using the Holy Spirit. It is to their benefit and for their ministry. What a dangerous thing. Power and giftings, but not regeneration and sanctification. You say, prove this biblically. I intend to. I intend to. Let me give you some examples. King Saul in the Old Testament. See, if I can see it biblically, then the church doesn't confuse me. We see things all across the church in this nation, and it's confusing. Remember King Saul? The Holy Spirit comes on him. Can't do that, unregenerate man, can you? Can't you? Can't you? A man filled with bitterness, anger, murder, jealousy, venom. He's got a God-chosen position, authority, prophecies over his life, anointing. Is it the inward oil or the outward oil? The outward oil. Saul, King Saul had the outward oil and his heart was wicked, depraved and far from God, but he had a real Holy Ghost anointing on him. Remember what the Bible says, that he prophesied but fell down naked. That's confusion. You have two spirits operating at the same time. Remember when David would play his harp? Then the evil spirit would leave him and the spirit of the Lord would come. Can you get a man unregenerate, set against God, trying to destroy a servant of God and the spirit of God comes on him? Yes. Don't you be confused by what's happening across America. You see, if you're caught up and, and, and you're in awe of the outward anointing, you can be deceived. What a dangerous thing. Remember the wise and foolish virgins are put in the context of Matthew 24. What was the first beginning of sorrows? Deception. Many men, prophets, prophetic ministries, are going to come and deceive many. Do you know what else he mentions in Matthew 24, verse 24? Many Christs. We say we can see through the JW Christ and the Mormon Christ and false Christs. That won't deceive you in this church. But do you know what it means, many Christs? The word Christ is anointed ones. It's the word to be anointed. There is going to come many anointed ones. Like a gifted prophetic ministry, these are the two things. Many in America, many false prophets, many false anointed ones. 
Do you realize the emphasis in this nation on the anointing is overpowering? Overpowering. If you think, you go, they're anointed. They have the anointing of the Holy Ghost. What do you mean? Do you realize how dangerous this is? I'm giving you this parable in its context and explaining it to you. There are false anointed ones. What is the anointing? Power for service, outward ministry, dynamism, power, the power, the works of the Holy Ghost. What does Jesus say on that day? Lord, 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 let us sin. Why? We did many Holy Ghost works, many dunamis works. There's going to be people coming and saying, I cast out demons, I healed the sick, I preached the gospel. I am guaranteed the kingdom of God. They deceive themselves by the outward oil in their lamp. No interest in the inward oil. Not only Saul, what about Balaam? I once wrote out a list of 15 points about Balaam. And I sat down with a very godly friend. He loved David Wilkerson, lived, uh, listened to David Wilkerson every day of the week. And I said, brother, there's a guest speaker. I just want to tell you about him. Would you go and hear him? And I listed out 15 points in the life of Balaam. And he said, boy, that's a dynamic preacher. Who is he? Where is he? I want to go hear him preach. I said, it's Balaam, the false prophet. Real Holy Ghost, real visions, a miracle that no one else in the entire Bible experienced. Even the Lord withheld him from some sin. I couldn't go. I can't take your money. The Spirit withheld me. Just later, he becomes a prosperity preacher, sells his soul to the devil. Do you think the real Holy Spirit outwardly cannot anoint a man who's a deceiver? I don't want to mess with your minds this morning. Pastor will sort this out after I leave. You you sort it all out, Pastor. What about Judas? As one of the 70 and one of the 12, sent out with power. Was that only the 11? Power. He gave unto the 12 power to cast out demons, heal the sick, and to preach the gospel. It's not inward oil. It is outward oil. It's oil in your lamp. It's that visible testimony that you see with the eye. But do you know what? They used up their oil in outward performance for their own benefit, and it was temporary and short-lived. And you know when it gets exposed? In the midnight hour, when they fall asleep. Do you know what we have coming here? And don't tell me it's all of the devil. It is of God. A midnight hour has dawned in America. And you know what? Everything is being exposed. And I'll get exposed financially. The lid is getting taken off. Everything will be revealed for what it is. It says in chapter 25 and 5 about these virgins, while the bridegroom tarried, See, if the bridegroom hadn't tarried, I thought he would come 20 years ago. I thought he'd come before he let us have a financial crisis or a COVID attack. We're not going to be here now. What happened? Has he forgotten about us? We used to preach. He wouldn't let us go through this. Do you know what? That tarrying period is of God. It's a time when there's a proneness to fall asleep. We've heard this year after year after year. And you know, in this period, you're going to see a slumber and a sleep come to the house of God. That tarrying period is so dangerous. What does the word tarried mean? It means to delay. He takes longer than you expected. A long interval comes that you never added into the equation. He didn't come early as expected. He delayed until midnight. The father knows the right time to send the son. It's a cold hour, a dark hour. 
until the time of the beginning of sorrows. This is not meant to happen to me. I don't like being here now. It was easier to be a Christian 10 years ago with all the conventions and all the preachers and all the excitement. Now it's getting thin on the ground. It's a remnant. The preachers are few and the churches are few and the real believers are few. And now the Lord is tiring. Lord, what's going on? I I think you made a mistake. Shouldn't you have come for me by now? I shouldn't have to face this. The Lord is tarrying. You know what? It's the wise and foolish virgins are going to face their darkness of night. You know what? In this time, we're going to find out, do you only have oil in your lamp or do you have something more? It's a crisis hour. He says in verse 13, watch for you know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. He means keep awake, be vigilant. Stir yourself. Saints of God in this church, stir yourself. There is an apathy. There is a power of darkness. There is a lukewarm coldness. The love of many is waxing cold. Why don't you burn bright in this hour? Saints of God, you need the inward oil of the Holy Spirit. You can't do this by yourself. You need the real Holy Ghost. Thank God for public ministry, and I've got a high view of ministry, but it's not about that. It definitely is not. It says in Matthew 24, 48, but, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. I thought he would have come by now. What's gone wrong? Wish wish he would have come when B.H. Clendenham was here. At a Bowman convention. Easier. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants. Listen to this very carefully. And they eat and they drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant, he's a servant acting like the world. And it shall come to pass in that day when he looketh not for him. And in an hour when he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. An evil servant, the word evil there, not only a foolish, but an evil servant, worthless, bad, harmful. It's a contradiction, unreliable, an evil servant. You're meant to be a servant. What is a servant? A slave, a doulos. They are servants saying, what do you want me to do? They're not doing what the Lord has them to do. They're called a servant, but they are not a servant. They shall begin to say in their heart, not with their mouth, not with their words, in their heart. This is a thought rolling in their mind. My, my Lord delayeth his coming. It's inward in the heart, his thoughts, his attitude of heart. You know what it says in verse 51? They're hypocrites. The word hypocrite means an actor on the stage. They're playing a part. They're going through the motions. They're in the right place, doing the right thing, with the right people, all all the time, every week. But they're going through the motions. It's an unreality. They're foolish. They're evil. Notice how the mark of them, they begin to smite the fellow servants, all their servants in the house of God. How do I know? How do I recognize servants who are evil, who actually believe the Lord is delaying his coming? They begin to smite their brothers. Do you know what they're doing? They're getting angry with them. They use their words to smite their brothers. They use actions, attitudes, gossip, slander, They try to damage their brother in the house of God. How can you have a real Christian who wants to hurt another Christian? How can you have that? The pastor preacher who done me the most damage in my entire life, I mean damage like I will never repair. Evil, wicked, lies, slander, damaged me in the house of God. I've never once for one second had a hard attitude against him, not once. And that's not natural. 
I'm very glad for it. I didn't pray through that. I didn't seek it. It was the grace of God. I can't even do that to an enemy. A man that set himself to destroy me and said he would get School of Christ and Keith Malcolmson out of Ireland. He would destroy the school operating in that land. And yet no bitterness, no envy, no jealousy. You know what? I'm scared for his soul. No man with that anger and venom smiting your fellow servants. Do you know in the church, we're men to love our enemies. And all across the church in this land, you'll get brother angry with his brother. You don't even get brothers loving brother. You're men to love your enemies. Pray for your enemies. And yet we're trying to get Christians to say, you ought to love one another. I will not. Do you see what Christ is saying here? That's got everything to do with people who think the master's delayed is coming. And you know what? Many of these say, I believe he's coming tonight. I know he's coming tonight. You don't believe anything. If you did, you'd be on your knees repenting, saying, oh God, don't let me walk out of this sanctuary this morning with this attitude of my heart. I dare not. I tremble. How could I hold anything against anybody when Jesus died for me, a sinner? Saying to God, have you offended Christ? Did you sin against Christ? Has he forgiven you? Of course he has. But he forgives you and you can't forgive one another. He didn't only do that. It says, and to eat and to drink with the drunken. The word drunken can mean satisfied, just filled to capacity. You've got everything. These people start to just live their own life. It certainly means drunkenness, but it means more. You've got everything you need. You're okay. You're satisfied. You're fine. No worries. No concerns. You just begin to live like the world. You know why? You think he's delayed his coming. You're not as urgent as you're meant to be. Third and finally, I want to close with this. The wise virgins. Seeing who the foolish virgins are. Who are the wise virgins? It says in verse 2, and five of them were wise. Verse 4, but the wise. Verse 9, but the wise. Do you see the contrast to the foolish virgins? The wise. The foolish are brainless. They're not living in reality. They've lost touch with reality. Those that are urgently saying, come Lord Jesus, I have adjusted myself. I have changed myself. I have prepared myself. I am ready this morning. They're wise. But the wise, the word wise here, the actual Greek word means to be thoughtful. To rein in or to curb in the thoughts in your hand. It's speaking of a cautious character to take captive the thoughts in order to protect the attitudes of your heart. If you think you can let any thoughts, accusations go through your mind unchecked with the Word of God, if you allow that to roll long enough, I thank God for my mother, a godly woman, Back in the UK, it's Mother's Day today. It's not in America, but it is over there. I had a godly mother. She says, son, you can't stop, from a young boy, you can't stop the birds flying over your head. But you can stop that bird from nesting in your hair. I've never once seen in my lifetime a bird building a nest in a man's hair. Not once so far. But in this generation, you never know what comes down the road. <laughs> Not long and we'll see it. But that mother said, just because you get thoughts doesn't mean you've sinned. Yeah. So thankful for that wisdom. Yeah. Many thoughts. I wouldn't like you to know all the thoughts that go through my mind. I wouldn't. I'm just like you. I have thoughts. Yeah. I, I've literally shook my head to try and get it out. Yeah. So God help me. Yeah. You're prone to that. You have that. But that's not sin. 
And then when you sin, you can repent and get right with God. But when you allow thoughts to build a stronghold in your mind, and then you know what happens next? It becomes an attitude of the heart. An attitude of the heart doesn't happen overnight. It is one thought, then a second thought, then a third thought, then a fifth thought. And it begins to build so strong, you don't even have power anymore. It is now not a thought, but it's a stronghold. And it begins to mold the attitudes of your heart, how you think, how you believe. The very intense and depth. You see, your mind is the gate. The word for mind in the Bible or thinking, it means a gateway or a doorway. In other words, In your mind, you can protect the heart or you can protect what goes into the heart. That's what it's meant to do. The battle of the mind, the warfare is for the mind because if it becomes an attitude of the heart, you know how it's going to manifest? In actions and decisions and in words. Now you're on dangerous ground. Look at these wise virgins. The word means to be wise is to be thoughtful to curb in all those thoughts, take the thoughts captive in order to protect your attitudes in your heart and therefore to mold the actions wisely by the Word of God. One great Greek scholar, he said this about the word wise, a type of wisdom relevant to practical action, implying good judgment, excellence of character, and good habits, sometimes referred to as practical virtue. That's what wisdom is, a wise virgin. You know what? It's got everything to do with character. Let me, as I close, define what these wise virgins who use their mind in a sanctified fashion, what do they look like? First of all, they fear God. It says in Proverbs 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You can't be wise without the fear of God. Do you know how I know they're wise or they fear God? You see, fear, the fear of God, when you stand before him, you go, I don't want to be foolish, brainless, casual, reckless, living in unreality. When you fear God, you go, I want to be wise. I want to curb in the thoughts. I watch over my mind and my attitudes. I don't want to be casual in my words and my actions. I want to be a wise virgin. The fear of God marks you like that. The fear of the Lord is to depart from sin and iniquity and disobedience. The fear of the Lord will make you run from sin. The fear of the Lord makes you to say, I don't want to even walk close to the world. I don't want to play with attitudes. I want to test everything with the scripture. The fear of the Lord is a purifying thing. It is a holy thing. It means reverence or respect or awesomeness. People now teach the fear of God doesn't mean fear. Then what does it mean? My Bible says tremble. Tremble in the presence of God. We've lost that trembling in the presence of God. Oh no, you don't need to, he's your chum now. He doesn't want you to be scared. Fear him. Not that can harm your body, but that can cast body and soul into hell. Saints of God, we're dealing with a holy and a righteous God in this hour. Why do you think there's preachers and pastors committing sexual sin and have done for years? teaching heresy and apostasy, no fear of God. See, the wise virgins, they fear God. That's why they are wise. Then look at the difference in their actions from the foolish. Now it's not the similarities with the foolish. Let's look at the differences with the foolish. And how are they different from the foolish in their actions? Look at this, Matthew 25 and 4. But the wise, watch this carefully, But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Two vessels. The foolish only had lamps. Doesn't mention a vessel. And they had no oil. Why did they have no oil? They had no vessel. 
only the wise have an outward lamp and an inward vessel of oil. What does it say? They took their vessels. The foolish only took their lamps, seized, grabbed the ministry, the outward ministry and testimony. What do the wise do? They grab and they seize and they take care over the vessel. When you study this word vessel, the word actually means to be stored. It was the reservoir for the oil. It was a place of source. That's where you carried your source of oil. What is the source of the outward anointing? It is the inward anointing of the Holy Ghost. The outward will only carry you so far. It'll give you a Saul ministry and a Bala ministry and a Judas ministry. And I'll tell you what, when Judas stopped and said, why wasn't this oil sold and given to the poor? Guess who sided with them? The 11 against Jesus. Don't tell me it's not deceptive in this hour. Gifted ministries. But what about the poor and the charity? You could get someone sitting in the church and they care about this and that and not the other. They don't care about what's spiritual. You don't even realize what's in their hearts. You would side, you and I, here, all 11 did. Matthew did and John did. Even John. Wow. Sided with Judas against Jesus. Thank God they didn't have a vote, Pastor. Let's vote in Judas's proposal. Let's have your hands this morning. Since this scares me, if it could happen amongst the apostles. But do you know what you have here? You've got this vessel. The wise virgins have vessel. It is hidden away. The foolish don't even notice it. They don't desire it. They don't want it. They don't care about it because it doesn't impress the eye. This is private, secret. This is your ministry unto the Lord himself. This is personal communion and fellowship and inward motive and attitude of the hearts and agenda of the inward man. That's what it is. You know, this inward oil is all about the future. It's stored up for a future day, not to be used today. This soil isn't for now. It won't benefit you now like it will in the days to come. It is for the darkness of night. That's when everything gets revealed. I believe that we are approaching an hour. If Jesus had come 20 years ago, there's an awful lot in this nation would look good and look wise and look like virgins. 20 years later, they're exposed what exposed them? The delay, the time factor. He's delaying his coming. I'll smite my brother. You made the biggest mistake of your life. You don't realize what you've done. This was for the testing and the proving of the heart. Do you know the time we're in now is a revealer of every single heart? The Lord doesn't want you deceived. He's allowing you to go through this period and time right now. Saints of God, we need to purchase and make sure we have the inward oil. Outward oil in the lamp. Inward oil in the vessel. Your men have an outward lamp. You are filled with oil. But that in itself is nothing. It says in 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. That is the inward oil. Or what about 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19? It says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Do you see the mark of the indwelling spirit? You're not your own. You're redeemed by the blood. It's a life laid down. You're possessed by someone else. You are indwelt. You're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. It's a radical different thing. Notice as well in Matthew 24, 
45, it calls them faithful and wise servants in the last hour. Do you know the great mark of God's real bride in this hour? Faithfulness and wisdom. To be faithful means to be trustworthy, reliable. You can trust them. We're given another parable, the parable of the household. Listen, pastor, listen, preachers. The parable of the household for the last day. Who is the parable of the household about? The head of the home, the master of the home, the preacher in the church. Listen to what it says in verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household? It's the preacher or it's the father to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. They're faithful. They're ready. And they were ready. Who were ready? Went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. They were ready. They were faithful. They were wise. But they slumbered. Wise virgins. The elect of God. Those who are adjusted, who have the inward oil and the outward oil. And they slumbered because it's dark and it's cold and he's delayed and it seems to be long and they've waited and they've waited and they've waited and they've endured and it's getting dark and they're getting tired and their eyes start to get heavy and they begin to slumber and they fall into that state of half awake, half asleep and then into full sleep. The wise virgins. But that's not the end. There's going to be a midnight cry. An awakening. A trimming of the lamps. Saints of God, it's not over. Where I stop here this morning is where the church in America is right now, but it's not the end of the story. That's for another time and another day and another hour. But I want to assure you, there is coming a voice. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. There is coming a message and a word that this is the hour, this is the time. Look up, behold, your redemption draweth nigh. This is the hour. Go out to meet the bridegroom. Saints of God, trim your lamps. Begin to trim your lamps. And in that, that hour, what a crisis across this land when a re real revival comes, a real awakening, a, a real moving of the Spirit of God. And multitudes, vast multitudes of false converts, of those that are apostates, rejectors of righteousness, who have no integrity, have no oil, they go looking for it, and an hour they ought not. But saints of God, the wise virgins are going to awake again. If you're a wise virgin, it is an hour. It is drawn nigh a time. We're going to have one last Holy Ghost revival. This, this is the wise virgins who are going to preach the gospel of the kingdom in every nation and then the end shall come. We've got one last commission, one last mission. Go preach the gospel. Go evangelize. Go reach the drug addict. Go reach the homosexual. Go reach the LGBT. Go reach those that have never heard the gospel. And while the mega churches in this nation and the big ministries and those are exposed all across this land, we'll evangelize one last generation that have never, ever heard the gospel before. Stand with me here this morning. Hallelujah. Saints of God, this altar is open. Let's consecrate our fresh. One last time, 
at the end of this week, let's just meet with the Lord. It is time, saints of God, it is so near. It is so near. Hear the voice of the bridegroom. Hear the call even this morning. Make ready, adjust to yourself. Change yourself for the coming of the bridegroom. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Just sir. 